I want to talk to you today about modern authority. We just sang about it. One word from him. Things change, amen? On his authority. On his authority. Uh, Authority is something that is misunderstood in our culture, uh, especially at the God level. Modern authority says it's about power, it's about title. Uh, The truth is, is that there's only one who can claim all authority. We're going to talk about him today. Connected to our commitment. You know, you will respect, you will honor authority that you're committed to. If you're not committed to it, you're not going to honor it, you're not going to respect it. Some people will say, you know, that's my authority in, in the workplace, referring to their boss, their, their, superior, their, their supervisor, the, the one who holds title, and they'll say, yeah, that's my boss, and I do what they say. But there may not be a respect there. There may not be, you might just be compliant. Uh, compliance and obedience are different. Compliance is, is uh, I'm going to do this, but I don't agree with it. Uh, you can't approach God that way. You know, I know, God, you said that, and I'm going to do it, but in your heart you disagree? That's not obedience. That's not honoring his authority. We've got to look at this because modern authorities kind of mess some things up, I believe, for the church. The church understanding modern authority in a biblical context is something, it's a commitment thing. And when you boil everything down about what you believe to be true about God, it comes down to his authority. He's either the one with all authority or he's not. And how you live your life uh, in accordance with his authority, uh, that should change how you live your life. The authority you have is only exercised out of the commitments you make. And you're committed to everything your life is producing right now. Let that statement sit for a second. You are committed to everything your life is producing right now. You don't like what your life's producing? Well, you might look at what you're committed to. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there's, it's more than just getting in line and following him. It's truly honoring him at an authority level, obedience, that no matter what he leads you to or what he leads you in or where he calls you to, that you obey from the heart of I'm honoring you because you are the one who has authority. That's where we should be. Look at your systems. Look at... at where you place your trust, your commitment right now, your faith is based upon authority. I mean, sometimes we don't think of it that way, but truly, what you put your faith in, a lot of people say they put their faith in God, but truly they put their faith in their ability. They put their faith in what they can handle. They put their faith in what their feelings are dictating in the moment. It really does come down to an authority issue. Uh, Systems, thoughts, words, relationships, actions, Timing, all of this really comes from a root of how we see authorities in our life. Authority refers to the right and the power to hold influence in a relationship. Authority is something that the Lord obviously uses with his creation. If you're in a place of authority and do not have power attached, this is an understanding of modern authority. If you're in a place of authority but don't have power attached to it, it's just a title. There's a lot of people walking around with titles, but they don't have much authority. Enter in the spiritual, and there's a lot of Christians walking around, and it looks like they hold a really great title, but it doesn't seem like they're operating in authority. I think that's a big issue. I think that's a big problem. Fathers and uh, and mothers, you have authority over your children, not necessarily your neighbor's. Or your neighbor's children, even though that might come in handy sometimes. Hunter was telling me he had a little boy in their neighborhood, and he was throwing a ball against their house. And he's like, they keep hearing this thump sound. And he goes out there and he goes, hey, are you you throwing a ball against my house? No. And so Hunter took his ball and threw it away. No, I'm teasing. He didn't. Now, sometimes it would be nice to have authority where we don't have it, or we wish we had a little more influence with the authority that's available or not available. Army lieutenant has authority over his platoon, not necessarily the company commander. We understand these levels of authority. A teacher has authority over students in the classroom, but not the parents. Though that would be nice sometimes. And the teachers said, amen. (laughs) Office manager may have authority over the secretarial staff, but not the CEO. This is how we understand modern authority, a hierarchy. 
You know, uh, you're, you're the boss of this area, but you're not the boss of that area. There is only one who is the boss, the authority over every area. There's only one who claims that, that being Jesus Christ. You look at it, Matthew 28, 18, it says that Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority, that's a powerful thing. We've talked about this for a few weeks, a powerful thing that Jesus would claim, all authority. Nobody else claims that, all authority. That every CEO, every, every owner of a company, every person on the planet has to understand there's no one higher than Jesus Christ. You say, well, they don't buy that. They don't believe that. Okay. He has this awesome place, this awesome title, beyond title, authority. Sometimes we listen to authorities and they have wrong information. They're an authority. They're considered an authority. Uh, they, they have a knowledge base. Uh, we would even say a wisdom about them. They're an authority of this subject, and we know they're telling us something wrong, something we know to not be true. You ever been told something to, by someone who was considered an authority, and they said, oh, you can't do that. It's never been done that way before. You ever been told that? You know, those who say it can't be done are amazed when they are interrupted by those doing it. <laughs> you know, our, our missionaries, I mean, they have children. I'm sure people said, hey, are you sure God said? Are you sure you want to go to the field? Are you sure that God's wanting you to do this? I mean, in, in, a, in a practical sense, I mean, you're going to take your kids. I mean, that would seem awfully difficult, don't you think? Well, if the one who has all authorities called you, that's a hard argument. Well, they're doing it. It should come as no surprise when authorities rise up to discount the all-authority factor of Jesus. It's a battlefront of the enemy. If the enemy can get us to question the all-authority claim of Jesus, well, that's, that is the battlefield. Write this down. When authority is removed, faith and trust can be weakened and destroyed. When authority is removed, faith and trust can be weakened and, is, and destroyed. If the enemy can just get you to question the Lord at an authority level, you say, well, how does that play out? Well, how would that play out at your job? Think of your, your boss, the one who has the authority to hire and to fire. And they say, hey, this needs to happen. And you say, I don't know. And they said, no, I, I, this needs to happen. This is how we're going to do this. And you go, well, I'm not sure. I'm going to think about it. How would that play at your job? Now, for some of you, you may go, well, yeah, my, my boss is, uh, they listen to me and all this. The truth is, you may have more influence and authority <laughs> over things than they do. However, in the spiritual sense, we never have room for that. We're never going to be at a point that God would speak to us that he would reveal something to us, that he would direct our life, and that we could go, Lord, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you out on this one. I, I know you have a good heart, and you love me, and you've done a lot for me, but I, I really think that we don't, we, I, I shouldn't do that. And there'll never be a time that God would go, oh, you know what, I didn't consider that. I, you are good. You're smart. Ooh. Uh, you know what, I'm going to talk to you about things uh, before I have you do them for now on. Uh, don't we treat his authority that way sometimes? You say, well, I've never said it that way. Yeah, but maybe you've thought it. You, have, you were given the opportunity when you came in today to receive a communion cup. My ushers, if you would look around, if you didn't receive that and you want to receive communion with us, if you would just raise your hand, they'll bring that to you. Uh, many of you got that when you came in. If you didn't, please raise your hand. They'll look around right now. Communion is more than just something we do. It's in place because we call it an ordinance of the church. There's two ordinances, ordinances of the church, water baptism and holy communion. Uh, communion is something that we we do to remember because if you're like me, we forget things we shouldn't forget. We, uh, we don't set out to set aside important things, but that's just what happens in life, and sometimes things occur. 
If you're sitting there and you're going, I don't know if I'm eligible for communion. If you love Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus, you're eligible for communion. You say, oh, it's been a bad week, it's been rough, and I, I'm, just, I'm in a hard place. Well, then how much better <laughs> to remind yourself that it's not about you. It's about what Christ has done for you based on his authority, based on who he is, based on the truth that there's no one higher, there's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. I want to read you, before we receive this, I want to read you out of the message translation or paraphrase of the scripture. It, it brings it into a modern language. Uh, the apostle Paul is writing here, and he, he's giving an explanation of when Jesus received the, what we refer to as the Lord's Supper with his disciples uh, on the night he was betrayed. Literally, uh, this, this time, this moment, that he is a fulfillment of the Passover. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he's brought his disciples together, and Paul is reiterating that story, 1 Corinthians eleven, twenty-three through 32. He says, let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it's so centrally important. He says, I received my instructions from the master himself and passed them on to you. The master, Jesus, he says, he's, he's setting up the authority here. He says, on the night of his betrayal, took bread, having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood. My, cov my new covenant with you each time you drink this cup, he says, remember me. When somebody says remember something, they're, they're, they're qualifying the fact, the reality that you could forget this. Don't forget this. Remember this, he says. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. He says, you will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. Church, he's coming again, amen? He's coming again. I can't help but think it's not far off. But even if it is, we should live our lives with an urgency. Why? We have an authority who has commissioned us. We'll talk about that. He says, he says, you must never let familiarity breed contempt. He says, anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be a part of? He says, examine your motives, test your heart, come to this meal in holy awe. He says, if you give no thought, I would say, or worse, or, or worse don't care, about the broken body of the master when you eat and drink, you're running the risk of serious consequences. He says that's why so many of you, even now, are listless and sick and others have gone to an early grave. If we get this straight now, we won't have to be straightened out on, on it later. Better to be confronted by the master now than to face a fiery confrontation later. Communion is not just something we do. It's something that causes us to remember what Christ has done. We can't ever forget that. Based on one who claims all authority. And the truth is, is he either has it or he doesn't. In church, everything I see playing out and how he has worked in my life and how I've seen him work time and time again in others' lives, he has all authority in heaven and in earth. That's who we serve. That's who we remember. That's who we're talking about today. It's not modern authority that, oh, you have authority as long as you have the title. No. Jesus has all authority because of who he is. Take that bread in your hand. He's the bread of life. Lord Jesus, this bread we hold, God represents something you did for us when we didn't deserve it. You paid our debt in full when you gave yourself at Calvary, when you died, Lord, you paid the debt of sin. But Lord, we thank you right now because you are not just the Lamb of God, but you are the bread of life. 
and that, Lord, in you and only in you do we have life. Do we have forgiveness? Do we have the ability to be saved? God, thank you for what this bread represents. Lord, we don't come to this time because we're perfect. We come to this time because you've made it available and we remember. Lord, bless this bread as we take it. In your name, Jesus, I ask this. Amen. Would you eat? And ask you to take that cup. Open it. Maybe you're here and life's kind of tough right now. Maybe you've got a diagnosis lingering. You've got some test results you're waiting on. And you've got some difficult road to travel right now. Can I tell you, you don't have to do it alone. Word of God says that by his stripes we're healed. That we have a promise beyond just a spiritual salvation. We have a promise that starts right now that he'll be with us and he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us and that he is the healer, amen? He is the provider. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. God, our provider. This cup represents the blood of Christ as a covering over our sins. If you need a healing in your body right now, I'm just going to ask you to just hold that cup up right now. We're going to pray. Lord Jesus, all across this room, our cups that are raised that represent a faith knowing they have an ailment, but God, they have a healer. And Jesus, we remember that right now. That God, not just in the spiritual do you cleanse us, but God, in the physical, Lord Jesus, there is available to us a healing, a power. God, there is a natural power that you've placed in our bodies that heals, but God, some need a miracle. They need something that's supernatural, and Lord, you provide for that. And it's because of your authority. Jesus, bless this cup. God, let it represent the cover that is available to us for the multiple sins. God, I thank you that you not only conquered death, hell, and the grave, but Lord, you made a way for us to have life and have it abundantly. Bless this cup, I pray. Jesus, it's in your name we ask this. Amen. Would you drink? Amen. Tony Campolo, he was, or is, he's a professor emeritus at a university. Years, uh, for years, he had a very specific ministry uh, in the college university realms, and uh, he's kind of changed up his the theology a bit uh, that uh, I don't want to get into, but he's got some amazing stories that he uh, uh, had early on in his ministry, and one just stood out that I want to read to you, and how God works in the mundane, in his all authority. One who has all authority works differently than we work, doesn't he? God ever done something that you go, I, I don't know what you're doing, Lord, and then on the backside, you're like, oh, I see what you're doing. I see what you did there, God. Yeah. Uh, this is one of those stories Tony talks about. Tony Campolo, he, ta he tells about a time that he was asked to speak at a college, and before the service, eight men had had him kneel so they could place their hands on his head and pray. It was all about just asking the one who has all authority to just cover the speaker because what he's about to speak is going to be a powerful thing. And Tony was glad to have the prayer, but each of them prayed a long time. And the longer the prayer they prayed, they pushed on Tony's head. He didn't like that. And then they even seemed to wonder in their prayers, and one of the men didn't even pray for Tony. He said, uh, he prayed for some guy he was concerned about. He began to pray and said, Dear Lord, you know Charlie Stolzfus. He says, he lives in that silver trailer down the road a mile. And you know the trailer, Lord, just down the road on the right-hand side. And Tony wanted to interrupt and tell him that God already knew where the guy lived and didn't need directions, but he just knelt there trying to keep his head upright because they were pushing down on it. And he says, the prayer went on. And Lord, Charlie told me this morning he's going to leave his wife and three kids and step in to do something, oh God. And he says, bring that family back together. And with that, the prayer time ended, and Tony went on to preach at the college chapel. And things went well, and he got in his car, and he began to drive home. And as he drove onto the Pennsylvania Turnpike, tells the story, he saw a hitchhiker. He felt compelled to go pick him up. It wasn't something he normally did. And so he says, picked him up. He drove for a few minutes. And I said, hi, my name's Tony Campolo. What's yours? And he says, my name's Charlie Stoltzfus. 
He says, I couldn't believe it. I got off the turnpike at the next exit and headed back. He got a bit uneasy, and with that, and after a few minutes, he said, Hey, mister, where are you taking me? I said, I'm taking you home. He narrowed his eyes at me. Why? I said, because you just left your wife and three kids, right? That blew him away. He said, yeah, yeah, that's right. And with shock written all over his face, he plastered himself against the car door and never took his eyes off me. He says, then I really did him in as I drove right, into, right to his silver trailer. <laughs> he says, when I pulled up, his eyes seemed to bulge as he asked, how did you know that I lived here? I said, God told me, <laughs> because I believe God did tell me. And when he opened the trailer door, his wife explained, you're back, you're back, and, or exclaimed, and he whispered in her ear, and the more he talked, the bigger her eyes got. And I said, with real authority, he says, the two of you sit down. I'm going to talk, and you two are going to listen. And man, did they listen. And that afternoon, those two young people gave their heart to Christ. You know, that thing you're going through, that you seem like God's doing something different and is not so concerned about what you're going through or that mundaneness, uh, remember, we're serving the one who has all authority. And the one who has all authority has a really big job description. He's taking care of all kinds of things that are, believe it or not, as humbling as this could be to you, is not on your radar. How dare God to do something that he didn't tell you about? I mean, that's how we treat him, right? See, the one with all authority is working in areas that you can't be concerned with because it's not in your capacity to handle it, but it is in his. And he does it well. He's chosen to reach this world through his people, his followers. It's called missions. And he commissions his followers to go and commission other followers. I call it generational discipleship. It's disciples reaching disciples. Uh, it's, it's disciples making disciples who make disciples. You know, just to get somebody saved, that's awesome. But God's called us to make disciples. Disciples who make disciples who make disciples. That's the method of the one who has all authority. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, here it is in context. Jesus came, he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. What a promise to the end of the age. In other words, Jesus builds his church. He gathers together his people, his flock, we could say, from the nations of the world through the word of those he sends. Church, none of us are above that calling. Well, that's just not for me. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's just not how I work, but that's how the one who has all authority works. This world wants truth. It needs it. It's been told a lie for far too long. Uh, you know, sometimes I talked about authorities. Uh, authorities considered people who know things beyond the common knowledge. They, they have engaged in a, maybe a science or a methodology or a system, and, and out of that they have been told, or they, they have come about with they're an authority. They have a certificate. They have a diploma. And I'm not discounting any of that. I'm reminded centuries ago, there's a name, if I said it, it's very familiar, Aristotle. Aristotle was considered uh, one of the, if not the greatest thinker in some realms, even today. What's interesting is Aristotle... He came up with a concept, with a, a philosophy, with an idea that the heavier an object is, the faster it will fall. The heavier an object is, the faster it will fall. Therefore, if two objects, one's heavier than the other, the heavier one will fall faster than the lighter one. Now, some of you are already ahead of me. Aristotle, for 2,000 years, I know sometimes we hear these names and we think they lived at the same time frame, but Aristotle, for 2,000 years, that was a, a philosophy he taught and people bought it. And a man by the name of Galileo, very familiar name, but they're 2,000 years apart. Galileo says, 
uh, that's not right. And he calls on a bunch of professors and teachers, and he brings them to the Tower of Pisa. And he, he goes up in the Tower of Pisa. He has a 10-pound right, weight and a 1-pound weight. And he drops them off, and they fall at the same rate, and they land at the same time. And he goes, this is not right. What Aristotle said is not right. And many of the professors and teachers saw this happen and said, no, we don't believe it. Aristotle is right. Even our eyes have seen that that is not correct. However, because we believe what we believe and we want to believe what we believe, that's where our faith is. That Aristotle was an authority, therefore we believe him. We don't even believe what we see. How many times does that play out in people's lives? You tell them Jesus Christ is the only way. Jesus Christ, the one who has all authority, is the only one that will never leave you or forsake you, has given everything to you to make a way where there was no way. And time and time again, people will experience that in their lives and then turn and walk away. People will experience Christ touching their life like none other and walk away because of authority. I'm going to follow this authority now. And that authority could be their feeling. That authority could be a person, a sense, an opportunity. And they walk right away from the one who has all authority. If that's you, church, you're missing the greatest opportunity of a lifetime. To be a Christ follower, you're an ambassador, you're an emissary, you're a representative that when you go into a situation, it's not what you can bring, it's what he brings through you. You've heard me say this dozens of times. Nobody's exempt from presenting the truth under God's authority. In, in every situation, Luke ten sixteen says, the one who hears you hears me. So what you're saying as an emissary, as an ambassador of Christ, as a follower of one who has all authority, when you walk into a situation, what you are saying is representative to who he is. You say, well, that's why, yeah, I probably shouldn't say much because what I say is probably not real good representation to, okay, you got an authority problem. Somehow you've bought into the understanding of modern authority and not what lordship brings to authority. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, Jesus says, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. He has chosen you. He's chosen me. He's chosen his church to be the vehicle, to be the thing he uses to reach this world. How are we doing? There's no, partial out of, there's no partiality with Jesus in this mission he's called us to. It's not Western. It's not Eastern, it's not Northern, it's not Southern. It's simply operating in his sovereignty. Think of this, the authority of his sovereignty brings unity. The authority of his sovereignty brings unity. Think of his authority. Uh, so many times, an authority in our mindset, modern authority, uh, there's a lot of times there's a lot of politics. Politics is considered a great authority right now in our world. You'll, you'll see a news thing, and, and you'll hear the, the politics uh, woven into it. You're like, how could that be? Oh, it's politics. Or, or the, the power of money. Why would they approve this? Why would they disapprove that? Why would they? And, and you trace the dollar, and it comes back to it. See, God doesn't do that with his authority because it's based on who he is. That's his character. That's his whole being, and that's how he calls us. Because we're going to go into situations that has modern authority and politics are in play and money's at play and leverage and, and title. And God just says, I'm going to call you in there and I'm going to empower you to do what I've called you to do. And you're going to be a light in darkness. And when you talk, it's as though I'm talking in that situation. And when they hear you, they hear me. And when they choose not to listen, they choose not to listen to me. That's authority. The authority of his sovereignty brings unity. It brings people together because when we're truly operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, when we speak, we heard it in the story of our missionaries, even witch doctors get saved. You say, yeah, but you just don't know 
this person and you just don't know them and they want nothing to do with Jesus. Can I tell you, Jesus wants something to do with them. And you say, well, then Jesus needs to go get them. Well, that's where you enter the equation. And you say, well, but I don't even like them. But guess what? Jesus does, the one who has all authority, and he'll even use you in that situation if you'll let him. I close with this. My challenge to you today is to realize that we have a huge world before us that needs to know Jesus. And there is a solution. And I'm talking to the solutions. I'm talking to the people that God wants to use to reach this world. We each have been equipped to reach our world. Where you have influence, we've been equipped for that. And some he takes to other places and he develops that influence. He's commissioned every one of us to do our part. And the simple question is this, are you doing your part? Are you doing your part? You know, are you committed to operating in his authority in and through your life? Well, that's a huge, huge question. Because many will say, well, this part of my life, I'm, I'm pretty good at giving him the authority. But this part, yeah, I keep taking back the controls. I keep unbuckling the seatbelt, and I keep wanting to reroute. I keep wanting to take control. Does he have opportunity to work daily in your life? That's a big one. How you see life, how you see people, is it how Jesus sees life and sees people? I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. I want to read you one last scripture, Matthew 9, 35 through 38. It says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, it says he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, he says, the, the harvest is plentiful. He said, but the laborers are few. He says, therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. In, in other words, Jesus the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth, looked at the crowds, looked at the people. He saw the need, and he said, we don't have enough people to help. I, I'm going to empower the people that take me at my word. I'm going to empower the people that will understand that it's by my authority that I call them, that I'm going to give them a word, and in that word, uh, things will change. That's, that's where we're to pray. God, send out laborers. And it's easy to pray that prayer. And oftentimes it goes like this. God, you see the situation. Lord, send someone else. God, you see how dark and, 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 and rough this, this area is. God, send somebody in that can speak. Send somebody in that can do. Send somebody. It's easy to pray that prayer for somebody else. Here's my challenge. Uh, what if you turn that? God, you know the situation I'm in. You know how dark it is. You know the difficulties, the complications. You know how rough this is. God, send me. But God, you know I can't do anything without you. And God, commission me. And God, if it's not me, uh, it, it, where I can be a solution, God, empower me in that. God, use me. Instead of passing it off, and try, instead of trying to go, okay, here's the baton. I'm tired of running. Lord, I just need a, a vacation from you. No, God, I need more power from you. All authority. I mean, can he send you? You say, well, he can. I mean, now's not a good time. We'll always have those excuses. But in light of his authority, excuses pass away. Are you committed to living in his authority? It's a commitment thing. It's a commitment thing. The reality of Jesus having all authority should change how you live your life. What an amazing word we just heard. Click here for video announcements and click here to subscribe and stay connected with Crosswalk Online.